Okay, In Defense of Ska will begin in just a moment. But first, I just want to say thank you for listening to the podcast. It means so much to us. And if you enjoy the podcast, tell your friends about it. Um, the best way to do that is to, you know, follow us on Instagram and Twitter and share our posts and let people know when they say, hey, is there a podcast I should be listening to? Say yes, In Defense of Ska. Go on to wherever you get podcasts from and subscribe to the podcast. Leave a five-star review. Let people know that you support In Defense of Ska, that you defend Ska. Thanks. Bill Stevenson is a legend. He's the drummer, primary songwriter, and only consistent member of iconic punk band The Descendants. He's also the drummer for the band All. He drummed in Black Flag for a period of time, and he's the owner-operator of Fort Collins, Colorado-based recording studio The Blasting Room. Bill has recorded a ton of punk bands, but he's also worked with quite a few ska bands like Kamuri, Less Than Jake, Suicide Machines, and Mustard Pluck. He worked with Mustard Plug on their latest album, Where Have All My Friends Gone, which released on Bad Time Records on September 8th. You know, I knew before that Mustard Plug had recorded with Bill Stevenson at the Blasting Room, but for some reason, like when we booked this, I was just excited to talk to the guy who played drums in Black Flag. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I'm so excited that there's a Black Flag ska connection. We need to know the Henry Rollins ska connection. That's, I think, the next on the list. Yeah. We'd like to have all the members of Black Flag on In Defensive Ska eventually. Yes. If you're listening, members of Black Flag, email us. We'll set up an interview. In Defensive Ska at gmail.com. You recently recorded uh, the new Mustard Plug record. Well, I don't know when. I don't know when the recording happened, but. I sure did. Me and, well, me and my. Me and my guys, um, you know, here at the blasting room. Yeah, that was in, uh, I think, December-ish, January, something like that. I know you've worked with them for a while. Forever. What was the process on this one like? You know, it's great because we're all very good and very old friends. And so it's, you, you, you jump right in uh, from, you know, from that point uh you know you don't have to kind of get to know people or worry about their egos or anything you just kind of dive right in and yeah they had their songs together they usually mustard plug usually has their songs you know really together before they come record they've they've done uh you know demoing sometimes you know lots of demoing and re-demoing they're a very um you know i mean i in punk rock and stuff i don't really like the term professional but i just mean I mean, they, they're they good at what they do, and they put a, a lot of effort into making sure it's good. Yeah, they just have it together. They got their shit together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dave said he they, Mustard Plug was the first ska band that came to you. Is that true? I do believe so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they were they were one of the first bands we ever recorded. Oh, really? I mean, at the Blasting Room. Okay. Now, you know... I had been uh, uh, basically way back then. It would have been with Stefan more. Uh, we had been producing records, uh, you know, since long before we actually owned a studio. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Mustard Plug were one of the one of the first bands at the Blasting Room. Yeah, and then we've done, we did, we did three more after that, or two more after that. Then we mixed a couple that we didn't record maybe here and there and then we then we recorded um another one i want we've e- we've either done four or five evil doers pray for mojo uh is the one called black and white yep oh yeah, yeah. it's called in black and white yeah in black and white and then the, the new one I, I feel like we've also mixed a couple or maybe there's one in there that i'm not remembering the title it's funny because I'm working on them like i'm doing where the sausage is made so a lot of times i'm working with working titles like you know, like Colin number five or Dave, you know, Dave number seven or yeah, Brandon number 42 or whatever. Like, and so I don't always know what the finished title was just because I'm still listening to my, maybe my rough mixes in my car that I like, you know, or something like that. Do you ever prefer your rough mixes to the final mix? Almost never. 
I think if if the rough mix is beating the final mix, then it means we we need to do some more mixing. <laughs> yeah. Or or maybe sometimes it's we need to do some less mixing. Mm. Sometimes you know you get in there and you just turn every knob and sideways and backwards and left and right reverb delay compression gating, and it's like wait where the hell did the song go? Yeah. <laughs> I know there was a song in here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Now I have had it a lot of times where we do rough mix and then the band hires, you know, a lot of times they'll, you know, maybe they hire a, you know, a famous mixer mm -hmm. or that sort of thing. And there've been a lot of times where I liked our roughs better than those mixes. Oh yeah. Yeah. I could see that. But, um, but, uh, but that's the kind of thing where we won't, we won't name names, you know? <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> so was mustard plug your first, uh, the first time you recorded horns? Well, did they come first or did Kimuri come first? I'm pretty sure it would have been Mustard Plug. Pretty sure Mustard Plug came first. So it was the first time that, let's see. Yeah, I think it was the first time we recorded horns. What was that experience like for you, especially coming from sort of this like punk rock background and stuff? A uh, couple things. To the positive side, um, all of us have a pretty pretty deep seated rearing in listening to a lot of jazz. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I know, I know what a horn's supposed to sound like, you know, I know when it's blatty and I know when it's sharp and when it's flat, I know when the person's too close to the mic, you know, I know all those things. I knew that before I ever heard ska, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, but, um, so I know, you know, I know what a horn's supposed to sound like, but okay. On that first muster plug record, we simply didn't have enough mics to like kind of, I like to set everything up and leave everything set up so that if anybody needs to go back and fix anything, it's already still set up how it was. Yeah. But in order to put like, you know, the really good mics on the drums and then also the really good mics on the vocals and the really good mics on the horns, we had to do a lot of switching around, you know, so I don't know that we had like the perfect mic on the horns, but I, I think it all worked out, um, you know, and, and I mean, to, to be you know laying all the cards on the table i mean there those horn players were pretty inexperienced at that time too so i think the microphones probably fit the player reasonably well <laughs> yeah for sure when and when you record horns are you when you were doing it initially and and then now are you trying to separate them all or are you having them all play together on like what's your method for that yeah it's I think with all recording, um, okay, the ideal thing, right, is you put a bunch of mics up and the band comes in and they all play the song perfectly. Right. And then you're done. <laughs> sure. You know, like how, <laughs> like how Elvis did it or, you know, whatever. Okay. But now working backwards from that ideal, you, you know, you start to isolate things and separate things and punch things in. Uh, you, you start to do that, uh, you know, kind of to the extent that it's necessary mm -hmm. uh so okay well we've got to overdub the horns all right we we, we found that out okay so because you know the horns and the guitars aren't in tune all the time do with each other and everything or plus that one figure where the horns were in key then you know then colin pulled his guitar out of tune so we're not okay so we're going to record the horn horn separately so let's get them all and let's do them all together um right next to each other so they can kind of, you know, see, cause a lot of, you know, you want that energy. A lot of times the recording process kind of sucks the energy out of mm -hmm. a record. So you, you know, you want to keep that group, the spirit of a band, at least to, to the, to the extent that it's possible. You want to keep that spirit there. So there they are all, all three of them sitting next to each other and, but they've each got their own mic. Okay. So you've got some control there like if you you, you you know a little bit of separation a little bit of isolation when it comes to to um in the mix down you know how to eq it or whatever but then what you also have is you've got those three guys in that room blowing into that room so your room mic see there that's the sound of three guys sharing the same air molecules okay that's a different thing then just, you know, one guy alone and then you got the room mic and then another guy alone and you got the room mic. Mm. That's not the same thing as three people sharing that airspace at the same time. It's a different sound. Yeah. And, but then let's say it's a tricky saxophone part 
well, okay, let's let's just overdub that as its own. So see, then you've broken it down even further. You know, you it's like you kind of have to micromanage the recording until you get everybody's part so that it's how 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 you want it. Nice. Oh, I see. It sounds like that secret sauce is kind of that the room mic. Uh, you know, you have some control when you have the mics up on the horns. Well, also the energy, though, also the energy of them all just being next to each other and, you know, they're sweating or they're breathing or whatever they're doing. They're making jokes with each other between takes. That stuff's all that stuff's really important, I think, for rock records. But when I say rock, I'm including punk, Scott, I'm including all of it, you know. Yeah. Anything that's not like, you know, uh, Britney Spears or whatever, you know, like that's all. Yeah. So it it's I guess what it you just you break it down only as far as you have to. Yeah. So even with the recording, let's say, okay, we, we got the horn section. Let's play the song. Oh, well, no, no, we got, we got the first verse pretty good. Okay. Now let's punch into the chorus together, all together. Right now let's get the chorus. Okay. We got the chorus. Now let's, now let's go for the bridge, you know, but ideally you just get the whole song. Right. Mm-hmm. And then if it's like, well, everybody's playing it perfect, but, you know, the damn trombone, he just keeps messing up on that one spot. So maybe it's like, okay, let's record the, the other two horns and then let's go and overdub the trombone and let him take as many tries as he needs to take on it until he gets it. Oh, that's good. Okay, I've got something controversial I want to I wanna get your opinion on. Oh, no. A lot of younger ska bands right now have been auto-tuning their horns. How does that make you feel? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it isn't that simple. <laughs> auto tune, yeah. Like as a noun, auto tune is a plugin. Yeah. And you can use it to do various kinds of pitch correction. Now, auto auto tune in quotes is a has become the term used for a sound, a like we could some would call it a perfect sound. I would call it, it just ruins it, ruins the music, okay? But there's a lot of lot of uh, room between, say, me using the auto-tune software myself manually, yep. syllable by syllable, phrase by phrase, to just help somebody sound a little more in key than they were. Okay, that's on one end. And then on the other end is you just slam the auto-tune on there as hard as you can, and you just get that that robot sound, that mechanical sound. So just like with many recording tools and just like with all tools in the world, it kind of depends on the skill of the person using it and also what their tastes happen to be. But if if I heard a bunch of horns that were just clamped down to like deadlocked on key, I would I would hate that more than yeah. anything. Cause then I would beg the question, why not just use a keyboard? You know, <laughs> that's what it ends up sounding like. Yeah. 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 I mean, you want, you want that movement and that's, that's where things, uh, a game of who's, who's using more, more kind of uh, dis- discerning and discretionary input, you know, coming from like their idea of what a great horn part sounds like, as opposed to, you can just press a button on autotune and it makes it perfectly mechanical, right? But I, I, we don't ever do that at the studio unless someone's like causing it to do that because they want that effect of it. Right. So it comes down to like using your taste and going, okay, well, he's definitely a little sharp on this part. Now, see, I can bring that down and not you and not the horn player and not John Coltrane himself would ever know that I did it because all I did was just flatten the tone of it a little bit in a gentle way and then it sounds better and it doesn't sound fake so i'm just saying there's a lot of ways to use the tuning softwares yeah yeah an out of tune horn section versus like a four piece like punk band that's out of tune out of tune horns can like ruin a song so fast absolutely yeah because it sounds like the uh, like the salvation army band <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but you can like deal with like a, a punk band who's clearly out of tune and kind of out of time. If it's, if it sort of fits a vibe, you know, like it seems like that's way more tolerable. I guess it kind of depends on the context. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I got a couple, I got, I read, a, I was reading some old interviews with uh, Musterplug. I got a, I read a few that they said about you. 
We're going to talk about farts now. <laughs> <laughs> well, first one is from uh, Jim Hoffer, the trombonist. And he says, uh, Bill has been a mentor to us over the years, really educating us on how to craft songs. He's also a friend, and it was great to just hang out with him and hear all his stories. So uh, do you, does that ring true? Did you kind of help mentor them in terms of like song craft? Oh, I think Jim's being generous there. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, with, with, with the, you know, when you're wearing the producer hat, there's, there's a, there aren't solid lines between, say, producer hat, engineer hat, song arranger hat, songwriter hat. So when a band comes in and every demo is just like perfect and there's not a hair out of place and it's like, don't touch a thing, just get a better recording of it. Okay. Then I'm, that's, that's a, that's one style of hat that I have on, but then some bands sound, send demos and there's, in my opinion, the songs have some, some, some things left to be desired. Uh, perhaps like the bridge is is uh too long or the bridge is in the wrong key or the bridge is too brief or the song doesn't have a bridge or the song needs an intro or i feel like they're playing the song a little too fast and it's making the vocal kind of sound uncomfortable or maybe they're playing the, the whole song in the wrong key that needs to be ra the key needs to be raised so that the vocalist can get a better a better punch out of it a little more projection by making them work a little harder for the notes or maybe the opposite's true. Maybe it's too high and he sounds straining on certain notes. So we bring the key down a little bit so that those key, those important melody passages, you know, are, can be sung well. So all the, all these little decisions, they're just little decisions you make along the way. But generally speaking, those guys are pretty solid songwriters and they've gotten, they've gotten to be better songwriters. You know, they've gotten to be excellent songwriters. Yeah, Mustard Plug's definitely a band who uh, I feel like have gotten better over the years and have made really good like later career albums. They're within the same realm of songs that they had made back in the '90s, but I, I feel like it's they've they've improved, they've grown. It's not like an a tired version of like what they had gotten popular off of. Yeah, y yeah. I mean, I just think. All the things you just said, uh, you know, plus some of the stuff I've said earlier in the interview, all all of that stuff is probably those are some of the reasons why they've had some staying power. You know, whereas ska in and of itself has been, you know, one of the biggest victims of the, you know, whimsical tides of the music industry. Mm -hmm, yeah. But I think Muster Plug has been largely resilient to those whimsical tides. Mm -hmm, yeah. Am I making too much lip smacking noises? Oh wait, you can't hear my you can't hear my lip smacking noises. Well, you can put a deesser on it, or you know they make that declicker thing too. That's cool. Because I'm drinking my drink here, but I don't think I'm being too noisy. I think it'll be fine. You can hear a little bit of a little bit of uh, the ice clinking in the glass, but I think that's a nice. Uh, it's a nice yeah. ambiance. That's a nice. You know, makes it feel real. Well, it's not even a glass glass. It's like a plastic glass. Uh huh. You know, if they if you get a large drink at like Disneyland or some shit, and they give you the big plastic cup, it's literally that. Where do you get the cup from? It's something. My my son got. I don't know. It's some dinosaur park or dinosaur museum or something. <laughs> I've been using it for so long, all the prints worn off of it. Oh, but it's man. like twenty. It's like twenty four ounces. So I make myself a tremendous double drink with uh with um two two pours of tequila one pour of margarita mix and then a whole can of bubbly water and a whole lime squoze in there and then uh some ice and that's where we segue into mustard plug in 1995 <laughs> gave me a thing it's called a travel bar and it's uh -huh. a little portable bar that's about it's like uh um let me think about the size of this thing say you had a small laptop mm -hmm. right okay a small laptop but the laptop was about five inches tall yeah that and it's a travel bar and they gave it to me on on the first record um because they were all really into making cocktails 
And, you know, Craig, now Craig was a tremendous drinker. Nobody can drink like Craig. <laughs> Nobody. And the way he says, he says it like this. He says, <clears throat> he's a big guy and he's got that night. And he goes, scotch, scotch. I can't do it like him. Scotch. <laughs> really, really nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Brandon Jennison, the trumpet player. This is from an interview he did in 2007. Bill makes really spicy food that will make you sweat and poop a lot. And <laughs> that's the quote. <laughs> right. Right. So um, for a while I was making um, maybe once a week when we had bands there, I'd make a big, big pot of kind of an Indian influenced dish. Uh, maybe start as like, say, a chana masala. Mm -hmm. But I would put this this kind of a seasoning in, and you'd have to look this up because they they don't have this in the U.S. But in like in Britain, if you go to an Indian joint, you get it, and it's called fall p h a l. And if you just Google that and look at a picture of that, like that's kind of what I was making. And it's um, you know, when you see those cooking shows and the dudes have the gas mask on in the back. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, that's it's that. It, and and uh, I was making that because I was really into it. I'm still into it, but it's 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 really. I, I think I've lost my ability to tolerate that level of spice. Mm. What's the What's the appeal for you to have incredibly spicy food? Do you like the physical sensation of it? I don't really know. There's a point, you know, at which it's just fun and exciting. Because I I'm I don't I'm not trying to have like a mashed potato sandwich with mayo on white. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm quoting Carl. That's a lyric of his. But at the same time, I'm not a hot wing guy, like where it's just that right on the tongue, burn your lip thing. I'm not that guy either. I, li I just like the food to have some depth to it, some yeah. richness. And, you know, if all Indian food has a depth and a richness to it. Mm -hmm. what's, what's your favorite thing to order for at an Indian restaurant? Well, it's the fall. I'll get yeah. like a a, sh a shrimp fall or a vegetable or lamb or whatever. And then I I love the chana masala. I love a tikka. I love a tikka masala. I love the the sag paneer. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I'm I love Indian food. It's just it's so rich, and you just if you just walk in the restaurant, you gained ten pounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. So let's see. I know you recorded Kamuri. Suicide Machines, Less Than Jake. Did, have you done, you've done Big D and the Kids Table, I believe? Yeah, we did those. Um, yeah, we did all of those, all those bands you mentioned. I mean, Kimuri is, um, in terms of how many times they've been to record an album, mm -hmm. I think, I think they have the record with Rise Against being right behind them. Mm -hmm. but if you go by how many actual hours and weeks and months spent in the studio, then it's like rise against, you know, times 300% compared to anybody. <laughs> oh yeah. They take, they take a lot of time. No, well, no, but I mean, no, I just mean too. They'll come back for like, we got to do a song for a movie or oh, okay. we got to do this. We got to do that. We got some live things we need to mix. We need, well, we want to come there and we want to come there and rehearse and have Bill yell at us and tell him to play stuff better. Like just <laughs> whatever, whatever it is. I mean, rise against has spent the most time in the building followed by, um, followed by, uh, Kimuri. And then I don't know if it would be r good riddance from there or Wilhelm's up there too. So what is, what is it? What are Kamuri like? How are they like to work with? Oh, they're consummate professionals. Mm -hmm. They're like, they're not, every song is arranged perfectly. And we have demos of them before they ever get on an airplane from Tokyo. It's just, it's all about getting really great recorded versions and great performances. So they have every detail worked out perfectly and they're all really strong players and they've had Kimuri has had some of the reals. They've had some really, really strong horn sections where mm -hmm. it was like yeah. blowing me away. Yeah. They're, they're, a, they're top shelf. They're far better than, um, I don't know with the exception of maybe fishbone or maybe there's a couple of exceptions, but they're far better than any of their American counterparts. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, I kind of found that going over to Japan and watching the bands over there, I felt like just everybody was kind of on on the next level. Even the sound people. Yeah, if they're doing like a Fat Records thing, it's like they've got it down tighter and better than any of the Fat Records bands. And whatever <laughs> it is, yeah, they're, whatever they're going to do, they're going to do it. I mean, you know, automobile, like, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Have you heard? So there's a record. I don't think it's one that they recorded with you. I'm talking about Kamuri, but they have a, an all covers record called Kamurified. Yeah, and, we did uh, it. Oh, you did it. Okay. Yeah. So they, so they do Bikeage by Descendants. Right. How did, <laughs> what did you think of that? And were you in the room when they recorded that? I produced the album with Jason. Yeah, of course I was. Is that, does that feel funny to you when a band is playing one of your songs in your studio? No, I mean, it's, I'm sort of a, maybe an insecure person or something. So it's kind of like, oh, this is awkward, but only for like 10 seconds. And then it's like, just shut up, Bill, and do your job. <laughs> I guess I, I, I think, and, and I think when people use this term, they're trying to give off like a false humility and I'm really not trying to do that, but I do suffer from a lot of uh, imposter syndrome. And so the fact that anybody's ever covered one of my songs, that just seems weird to me, not weird because it's bad for them to do it, but like, wow, I can't believe I managed to write a song that someone would cover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What did you think of their version of it? It was pretty cool. It's a yeah, it's a it's a very punk version with punk with horns. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you you've worked with Less and Jake quite a bit too. Yeah, but with them with them we always mix. Oh, so they don't actually record at the blasting room? I think it's always mixed. I can't I can't remember them ever recording here, but we've mixed like 11 billion records for them. <laughs> <laughs> but we we do have them on the calendar supposedly for uh let's see February or January or something. Hmm. We do have them on the calendar, but it's not firm yet for to I mean to actually record. Oh. Uh -huh. I think you know I mean I think what Rogers got his own studio. They're kind of doing their own thing down there. Or, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean they're you know they're they're big boys. They know how to they know how to record themselves. The stuff Roger produces, I think he does a good job. They released a song, uh, I think it was in 2018, called Bill. Have you have you listened to this song? Uh, I, I think I heard it once, but that that made <laughs> me even more um, embarrassed than like if somebody does a cover. Like I was like, oh my god. <laughs> I, I I don't know what it is. Maybe I have low self esteem or something. I'm not really sure what it is, but yeah, yeah, I I know, I yeah yeah. I mean that was nice. That was nice of them. Yeah, it's a very, very, um, I would say, open and emotional tribute to you as sort of the um, pioneer of a lot of like this culture that has blossomed from, you know, the, the 70s and the 80s. It's punk culture. Yeah, I mean, that's nice of them to say that. And it's interesting that they have that perspective on it. But then I then I'd have to turn around and start writing songs about all the bands that influenced us you know and everything mm -hmm. too i it to me it's more like all a big sort of a continuum like a river mm -hmm. yeah yeah but that well was very kind of them i mean they're good they're very close friends we're 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 all we're extremely close if you don't mind my asking how's uh how's milo doing oh he's doing great we yeah it it um so it was a very minor heart attack uh, didn't do any heart damage. Oh, that's and good. It was actually kind of a a strange stroke of good luck in a way because, okay, the downside was we had to cancel that those eight Europe shows, right? That was the downside. But the the upside was that while he was in the hospital, they discovered that one of his main arteries was almost completely blocked. So they repaired that. While uh -huh. he was in the hospital. So it's almost like he got this little warning heart attack. But if it had been six months later, it might it, it might have killed him. So now he's good to go. Yeah, I don't know if you saw any of those videos we were making. Uh, no, I did not. Oh, you got to go on Descendants thing and see the videos. There's this series. It's called Milo Has a Heart Attack. And it's just because <laughs> once, we, once we canceled the tour, 
everybody went home, the band and the crew, but I stayed, I stayed in Spain. At, I just stayed at the hotel and then until they, so um, I would walk to the hospital every day. And, and when I first got there, I, I was like, I was walking there and I was carrying his toothbrush and his phone charger, you know, cause I thought he might need them. So the first episode's called Milo has a heart attack. Bill brings Milo his toothbrush and phone charger. But all it is is it's us just sitting there. He's in his bed and we're together and it's like, hey, everybody, I'm okay. Everything's okay. Don't, you know, don't worry. And then the next day I go, that was fun. And people loved it because we, we don't do that kind of stuff. Descendants don't ever do that kind of like socials stuff. It always seems so cheesy. But so the next mm-hmm. day I walk in there and he's got the, we've got the, me- we're looking at the medical bills. And so I go, okay, Milo goes to the heart attack. Yeah, Milo has a heart attack. Episode two, Milo and Bill review the medical bills. And so it's just a real quick thing of us going like, well, okay, well, what if you get put 20,000 on the descendants credit card and then we can put 20, you know, trying to figure it out. And then the next day it was um, Milo reviews the new diet plan. And, you know, so he's talking about broccoli and Brussels sprouts. And I'm just telling him as soon as they let him out of here, I'm going to take him to get chili burgers, you know. And so we just kept making a new funny episode. And then the final episode was us flying home together and uh, I handed him off to his wife, you know, and, and the airport. And then um, I went home from there. So yeah, he's fine. He, he, the day they let him out, we went, he, we walked to the beach from the hotel or from the hospital and, uh, and we just, we swam all day and, you know, body surfed. And then we walked from the beach to some restaurant and had dinner. And then we walked from the, restaurant to the hotel he's fine he was walking faster than i was wow yeah, it's always yeah, it's a scary thing but yeah when it when it ends up being that it's uh not a big deal or you know that you caught it in time that's always great yeah he's fine so we we talked a bit about your uh, some of your thoughts about recording but um i guess i want to dig in a little deeper um in terms of generally deal with like punk bands or rock bands or you know there's there's a certain kind of band that you're dealing with i'm really curious your perspective about how you like really you know create good albums you know if there's like a a miking strategy or you know stuff like that yeah the question of like a strategy or approach or system yeah i don't i don't know that i have one i i feel like if i if i had a system and that would really just be code for I've just kind of gotten lazy and I'm doing things in a habitual manner. It seems like each band that comes in, there's, you I mean, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, but you do have to crack the code. You got to find out, you got to find out, okay, who's writing the songs, right? Okay, but then who's, who's really the person that kind of dictates some of the acute details of the phrasing, for instance? You know, the phrasing or the cadence, the way things go. There's usually one guy in the band that's kind of outspoken on those things. Uh, you know, who who are the stronger players? Who are the weaker players? Uh, and then and because this is, just comes down to, you know, with all these recordings, unfortunately, they're all they're all dictated by a budget. So you have to find out, OK, who are the guys I can that are going to take me like all day you know to get two songs done and who are the guys that can do all of their whole parts in three hours for the whole album and you know so you just you kind of have to get to know the band and if their songs aren't up to speed you got to either you can't just say these songs suck right that's no good so you got to either tell them offer a suggestion for how to fix the song or you know literally yeah literally pick up a guitar and go why don't we go to c sharp minor here instead um, or, you know, get behind the drum set. Hey, why don't you try this? How about this? What do you think about this? Is this good? Or else, you know, it doesn't really, or, or else if you can't fix the song or if they don't want to fix the song, then you go, well, can we, then I, instead of saying, can we drop this song? I might say, Hey, are there other songs we have to choose from? You know, there might be, a, I said, there might be a hidden gem. When I say there might be a hidden gem, it means like there's three songs I want to cut off the album. And I'm looking for something to replace them with, <laughs> you know. So it did, it's um one of my friends spent the day watching me work one day, and he and he goes, uh, he has a really high voice, you know. And he goes, "Dude, your job's your job's ten percent engineer, 
90% psychiatrist. And I, and I thought, well, that's, that's not completely true, but there's, there's some truth to that. You got, you got to get, you got to figure out how to get this all, get this all done to whatever the technical and qualitative standards that are being presented to you. But at the same time, you still, you still, still has to sound like that band. Mm -hmm. It can't just sound like, you know, quote, blasting room. It's got to sound like that band. You got to re you got to keep whatever the band's personality is. You got to try really hard to keep it. Even if it's means sitting there dealing with some way subpar guy and you're just punching in little tiny parts at a time, two bars at a time. And it's just, you're just going, I could play this song in my sleep. You know, when they, when he goes home tonight, I'm going to replay all this part. You can't do that. You know, I, I put a lot of value in like the sanctity of a band's identity and a band's personality. What is your process of getting to know you? So you talked about getting to know the band. So you have a brand new band in. Do you, do you kind of try to really watch them closely and on that first day? And no, I do what we're doing. I feel I do what we're doing. Like you've done a lot of interviews, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Do, don't you feel like we, we have made some connections because of the way we're speaking to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't you feel like it started happening right when we talked about doubly? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and so that's that's those are choices you make when you talk to people. And it's like I can, how am I going to really work for them if I don't know them? Oh, I see. Okay. So you a lot of times you open up to them and then they open up to you. Sometimes you got to go first though. Yeah. It's like you come in and it's like, "Oh, man, I had a really bad argument with my daughter, you know." And they're like, "Oh, yeah, I, my daughter's doing that too, you know." And then all of a sudden you and that guy are best friends. Mm -hmm. One thing that caught my attention on your website is that you have a uh, room in your studio that bands can rent, like if they just want to stay at the studio. Yeah, um, it's it's a it's simple accommodations, but most punk bands are are used to that. You know, they're used to going on tour and sleeping either. It's either three places you sleep when you're starting out. You sleep in the van, or if it's too hot, you sleep on top of the van, on the roof of the van. I used to get up on the <laughs> roof of the van and sleep. You used to sleep on the roof of the van? Sometimes, yeah. If it was too hot, like in Raleigh, in Raleigh in August, or, you know, New Orleans in August, like, where? well, you can't sleep in the van. Or, or you <laughs> try to stay at someone's house. Mm -hmm. Or you, like, all cram into one hotel room at like the shittiest hotel that has ever existed in the world <laughs> where on, where on the room to one side of you is a crack dealer and the room to the other side of you is prostitutes going full at it right that you rented that room for 18 bucks a night and you're all just crammed in there and there's bed bugs and crabs and scabies and all that stuff <laughs> so the bands i know i kind of digressed here right or diverged or something but yeah. so the bands, the bands are okay. It's there's a living room. It's like a normal size living room, maybe a little bigger, a kitchen, a, a really functional kitchen. You can cook like proper meals there. Uh, and then a, uh, and then like two bedrooms b between the two bedrooms, there's seven beds. And I always joke and I say, yeah, I can, I can handle a ska band. You know, we have seven beds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can handle a small ska band. Well, no, cause Kimuri usually brings. So it's the band, you know, so that's seven. And then a lot of times they'll have a photographer and or a manager and or a label guy. Mm -hmm. And so, but the thing is, we have these two really comfortable but short couches in the thing. But, you know, those dudes are short. Like they can, one, they can, we could put two, one on each couch. So that's nine. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like you really, it's a staying at the studio creates probably an even greater sense of immersion to this project you're working on. Like that's what you're doing. You're making this record right now. Yeah. I think a lot of musicians have trouble being distracted. And I think a lot of bands come to our place because it's such a, you know, Fort Collins isn't exactly the cultural Mecca. Mm -hmm. So they come here because it's like, yep, just we're in Fort Collins and we're just focused on the recording and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> also, just backing up really quick, talking about staying uh, at people's houses, because uh, I love hearing these sort of stories. 
What was the worst house you stayed at on tour? <laughs> I mean, I described it like we, you know, all the stuff I mentioned that all, and some of that stuff's hard to get rid of because it gets in the van. Say you've got a van with like a, a loft, you know, where they put a loft so you can sleep two up top and two down under. Sure. You've seen that, right? Of course. Yeah. Well, I had one of those in my van. Yeah, yeah. And so usually on the top, on the loft with the board, the board that goes across to make the loft, a lot of times you put carpet on that board, you know, just so you're not laying on wood. Yeah. And so if you do, let's just say, and I'm not saying this happened to us, but let's just say you were, a, you were a, a, a pop punk band on, on tour in 1985. And, uh-huh. you know, you did stay at someone's house and they, you slept in their, cat infested punk basement with whoever and let's say one of you did get scabies and then you did bring it into the van and everybody in the band did get it and that carpet (laughs) on the loft got it too and everybody's sleeping bags and you virtually have i'm not saying this happened to anybody that i know (laughs) you virtually have to disassemble your van and wash everything or throw everything away you have to take up like a whole laundromat and yeah. then you have to buy like a gallon of that, that quell oil or that rid or whatever you're doing, you know? So yeah, that, that, I don't think it's like that anymore. I think punk rock's all just like normal people now. I don't think those kind of punkers exist anymore. I, I think you'd be surprised. I think there's still some hanging on yeah. spreading scabies and dead bugs around. I can't wait. When, when you were forming all, or you were changing into all, you moved to Fort Collins what what was it about Fort Collins? What what drew you to Fort Collins specifically? Yeah, I always use the same answer for this. Um, you know the what is it? Is it called Goldilocks and the Three Bears? Is that the name of it? Mm-hmm. I think so. Where okay, this okay. So when we were in L.A., L.A. just got really, really trafficy and polluty and crimey and expensive and. Uh, you just, it, it felt like we were being driven out of LA almost certainly where, where I grew up, Hermosa Beach. I can't even afford to go to Hermosa Beach now. I can't even afford to go there as a tourist, let alone live there. Okay. So I felt like we kind of got pushed out of LA. We were, we were happy with our like 200, $300 guarantees, but we, we were, we were literally, we slept in our practice room for 10 years. Okay. So, so at a certain point we moved. So let's call that LA is the porridge. That's too hot. (laughs) So we moved to Missouri, moved to Missouri, to Brookfield, Missouri, a farm town, 4,000 people. And we rented a huge house for $200 a month compared to us paying 1200 a month to sleep in our practice room with no hot water. Okay. So we each had our own bedroom and even the roadies had places to sleep there. So there we were for four years. We were living like kings on our $300 guarantees, right? But then after four years, during the time we lived there, two things happened. First, the grunge thing happened and then the mall punk thing happened. So all of a sudden, you know, all and descendants were in high demand, you know, being the so-called progenitors of some of that stuff. Right. So, you know, we got a, we, we got a extreme record advance. And then we said, okay, we don't have to live in Brookfield anymore. We can move somewhere that's not Brookfield, Missouri. So that we'll call that Brookfield, Missouri. The porridge is too cold. And then we moved to Fort Collins because we had been through Fort Collins a lot of times and we had always had fun here. We had friends here and it was like a real easy place. I was, I don't know who suggested, Hey, what about Fort Collins? And everyone was like, yeah, Fort Collins. That's cool. So here here we are. Just right. Porridge is just right. Well, yeah, I figured you, people could (laughs) fill in the gaps there. (laughs) Right. So Fort Collins, Colorado. The porridge is just right. Yeah. Yep. No, I actually lived there for like, I don't know, a couple months back in the, God, when was that? Like early 2000s. Just my wife ah. is from, she's not from Fort Collins. She's from um, Lafayette. So yeah, we just, we, we ended up there a bit. It's a nice town. It's like a, it's kind of a, I haven't been there for a while. I don't know if it's like grown, but it's kind of a small-ish college type town with kind of a fun downtown sort of situation. That's how I remember it. What's Fort Collins like these days? Is it more or less the same or is it 
grown or changed? It's definitely much bigger. I may, I probably wouldn't have moved here if it was this big, you know, when we moved here, I probably wouldn't have. So we also, you know, I've, I've always, I think we've all, we all kind of like, like your, your, your Austin, Texas, Athens, Georgia, mm-hmm. Fort Collins. Uh, I, I can't think of uh, other ones, but these kind of like big towns or small cities. And so, yeah, we, we, we checked around Austin too, but by the time we got our, our boots on the ground, Austin was just too big and blown out. Um, Cause I really wanted to move to Austin in like the late seventies, early eighties. Oh, I want to live here, but mm-hmm. it got, it got blown out. And so I don't, I don't know, like if I was going to move somewhere right now, where would it be? Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I look around every so often. It's like, ah, I'm tired of being, but I can't really, I can't find a place that, that better suits me unless I, if I win the lottery, I'll move back to the beach. So the the advance you're talking about was was from Interscope, and that was with the uh, Pummel record for all, right? Yeah. And so y- you specifically built a studio, the Blasting Room, with that money instead of um, you know renting a studio. Exactly. Yeah, a smart move, by the way. And more bands need to do this. <laughs> I have to it, give the credit there to Stefan because yeah. he he I think. Uh, for me, it was like, okay, let's take a uh, hundred grand and let's build uh, like our own headquarter, our own where we can practice, do demos, and make our own records. I think he saw that it would become way more than that, and and it it became way more than that without us doing anything. We didn't even have paint on the walls yet, and bands were calling. You know, my, my phone, my personal phone to, um, cause we didn't put our phone number in the phone book or we didn't even have a phone, but bands were calling and it's like, I, we hear you, we hear you guys built a studio, you know, we want to come record. And it was like, um, you know, that thing, if you build it, they will come. Yeah. I mean, it just did that. Maybe Stefan knew it all along, but I, I didn't realize the bands would just come there to us, you know, and then we had Jason was right in there. I mean, right when we started building it, Jason was in there with us and, and uh, we just, uh, we kind of made it, it became its own, um, its own uh, thing, you know, not, not, you know, not directly connected to Descendants or all. Do you know who the first band or two that you recorded that wasn't all or Descendants? Well, the first kind of known band and I, that I always let I always let them be the first band, even though they're they're really not. Um, <laughs> is um, Hagfish, okay? And that's um, you know Zach Blair, Zach and Donnie Blair. Uh, Zach plays in Rise Against now, but I mean he was originally so Hagfish. But but um, but right before them though, there was a band called Alligator Gun, and that record's really good. I was at a party and they were playing that and I was like, what's this? You know, cause it's been 9,000 years ago and they go, oh, this is that alligator gun record. I'm like, all right, that's a really good record. But we also, I think we did some like, uh, local bands like armchair Martian social joke. Um, I wonder, I wonder if the armchair Martian demo, I don't know the chronology, but those are, so those are some of the first things. Mustard plug was right in there, right in the beginning. In like the first 10, maybe. Oh, definitely. Absolutely. Wow. When I lived in Fort Collins and, and a little before I lived in Fort Collins, a friend of mine had been living there and he, he was a bass player and he was in a band like a, like a folk rock bar band called the Bob Hollister band. Do you happen to know Bob Hollister? That's weird. The name sounds familiar, but I wonder it's because of that like yuppie preppy clothing shit thing, <laughs> whatever that you call that. It's a yuppie preppy, like, you know, former hippie now turned, you know, folk rock type of. What's well, funny because when I first saw that clothing line, Hollister, yeah, mm-hmm. I was positive that it was an emo band. Doesn't that sound <laughs> like an emo band name, Hollister? Yeah, totally. yeah. Like Alistair. No, I mean, really, really think about it for a second. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. I see you. what you're talking about. I, I always thought it was an emo band. Aaron and I grew up in Gilroy, 
which is what 30 minutes 30 minutes north of hollister california yeah oh hollister's a city oh yeah Yeah. and that's where the clothing are made no no i don't know why they picked it because it's got like a beach aesthetic but it's it's not near the beach uh no i was positive i want to say the first time i i got the nerve i go hey what do they sound like (laughs) <laughs> and the first, like, what, what do who sound like? Oh, my. Did it feel natural to you to record bands and to work with bands to be on that end of things? Yeah, regrettably, I used to be quite a quite a little uh, taskmaster in the band in the old days. I mean, when the band started, it was definitely it was Frank's band. Okay, period. Mm-hmm. And, you know, then Tony came in and Tony started writing songs to. You know, the first band, I don't know if you've heard that the album Ninth of Walnut. I mean, that's those mm-hmm, were all yeah. our first songs. And Frank wrote, you know, 85% of them. But then uh, Tony started writing them. And then once I started writing them, I, I, once I got a real grip on how to play guitar and how to play bass, and then all of a sudden I just thought I was like Mr. Genius Musician. <laughs> and I started like really throwing my weight around and just – Hey, play it like this instead. Play it like that instead. So sadly, I I kind of came by that naturally, I think. But but maybe in a more innocent, if we look at it from a, m- a more innocent perspective, I remember being super young, like eight, seven, and listening to, say, say like a Beatles song and just going, oh, wow, okay. So there's that guitar is doing that thing. And that, what's that low guitar doing? The boom, doo doom. What's that? And and I would, you know, I remember as a kid trying to like deconstruct a recording. So I I think I come by it pretty naturally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it reflects the way your brain works. So the the, the first Descendants record you recorded at the Blessing Room was Everything Sucks, and um, I found a a, a B side from that session called Gotta. Right, right, right. Oh, nice. Oh, good for this. Yeah, yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fun. Is that the only Descended Ska song? Well, Tony wrote this song and he says, I want to I want to have like the guitar. I want the guitar to do like these upstrokes in the verse. You know, the rest of it isn't that the rest of it's just yeah. like a normal Descendant song. But the verse has that upbeat on the, in the thing. And it, Tony was like, Tony would come in and he usually had a lot of specific ideas about whatever influences he was pulling from or whatever. And, and I, I think he was like, yeah, so that, that kind of has that, that scoff feel in the verse. Although, I mean, I think we do it poorly, but still maybe, maybe there are a few people got a kick out of it, or maybe they were like, what are they trying to be? It's going to be, well, it's a little late for that, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I wasn't aware of that song. Cause it wasn't, it wasn't on like a, I think it was just a B size. So I didn't know about that song until recently. It was on a thing called, it was, there was there used to be a thing called sessions. I don't know if they were clothing or record or what they were, but there's a seven inch. Like you could look it up, Descendants Sessions seven inch, and it's got God on one side, and I don't remember what on the other side. So when when all I got signed to Interscope, um, you, so this was sort of like a your the big mainstream moment you had very briefly. I watched a, I watched the clip of a, of you guys on Conan O'Brien, which was a pretty trip. That was trippy to watch. Yeah, but I mean, it's just us playing. Like we didn't yeah, yeah. nothing. Nothing changed. I mean, that's. I don't know what they thought they were throwing all this money at, but yeah, I mean, we we just stayed. And if anything, Pummel's like less accessible than our other records because <laughs> it's got a lot of dark material on it. You know, heavier dark material. Yeah, yeah. Carl, I mean, a lot of his songs on that. I mean, he was he was pert near suicidal during that period, so he. He, his songs are really dark on that record. I mean, I guess 95, 96 is a period where punk is suddenly a mainstream genre. So I think labels are just like, think that the next big thing could be anywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the major label mentality is, is sign 10, drop nine. Yeah. You sign 10 bands, drop nine. The, uh, the 10th one becomes mega superstar and you make all your money back. Yeah. Yeah. Did I know, I know you didn't last long. Did, was it not a, not a fun experience or what did you, you just, not... we didn't last long. What band's been together longer than us on Interscope? 
the hell are you talking about on the label? I meant on the label. You moved to Epitaph uh, pretty quickly after that, if, as I understand it. Well, yeah. So that that it's that was a weird thing. So the person that signed us to Interscope, normally when you get signed to a major label, you 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 have someone there. They're called an A and R person, which stands for Artist and Repertoire. There's someone there that that went out and saw you and liked you and is there at the label advocating for you and championing for you, right? Yeah. And that's called your A&R guy. Well, right, I swear, two months after, two months after we got signed, our A&R guy got strung out on heroin and just never showed up back at the label. <laughs> Oh, God. So we did. We released Pummel and all that without an A and R person. There was no one at the label advocating for us. And this person I'm talking about, he's just like never to be seen again, literally. But this was a guy. You know, this was one of the golden boys. Like he signed, he signed Soundgarden, Extreme, Gin Blossoms. Uh, let's see, a couple other you know really big bands, like two more huge bands. And so, so he was like the golden boy. So he got the huge money for us, but then he vanished off the face of the earth. So we were there with no A&R guy. So, you know, I met with the label when it was time to do the next album and I played him demos and I played him demos with like, you know, I'm the one and uh, you know, when I get old, I mean, those I'm the one when I get old, thank you there. You know, those are really strong songs. Yeah. And uh, it, I could tell there was just no connection there. So we just kind of, we just kind of um, severed, we just parted ways, you know, and then we, and whereas Epitaph was like, hell yeah, you know. <laughs> sure, yeah. But then, so every, everything sucks um, comes out, and and I, I believe Descendants is touring pretty heavily during that 96, 97 period, right? I mean, it, for us, it was a lot. We did a, we did a three week leg, and, uh, we did a three week leg and a f- five week leg and a four week leg plus a plus a three week leg in Europe. I mean, that was, that was a lot for, for like how old we were and stuff. I mean, yeah, that was a, that was a pretty solid year. Yeah. Suicide machines were one of the bands that opened for you on that. One of those tours. Yeah. One of the tours was suicide machines and shades apart and descendants. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And it's tough going on after suicide machines. They don't play around. No. What do you remember from those from those sets? Like when you think back on it, what's the mental image? Well, with the Suicide Machines, to me, there's two shows. Uh-huh. There's the show that's happening in the front, which is like really, really high intensity, high energy, a lot of like entertainment value. Mm-hmm. Okay, you know, because Descendants doesn't bring a lot of entertainment value. We're just more focusing on kind of getting these songs out the right way. A lot of our phrasing is just innately very tricky but we play it you know it goes by without you even realizing how tricky it was like almost like a sleight of hand yeah but so they were very they had a lot of entertainment value and so that was the show in the front but if you were behind where i often was <laughs> uh behind the band doing my stretches you know before we play doing my i i mean you could call it yoga but that just sounds so lame i mean just doing my stretches mm-hmm. i've been doing these same stretches since i was 19 years old Right. And, uh, but to be back there and watching Derek and Royce, now that was more like you were at a prog rock show almost like, yeah. no, they were, they would cut it up like crazy. And they had all these little punches and accents and little in jokes between the two of them. Oh, it was, it was great to do your stretches and to warm up and be, you know, behind the thing and watching those two just going at it. That's so sick. I actually, this is one of the things I wanted to ask you. What stretches do you do to warm up for a show? Oh, it's so funny. I started getting all this stress. I had really bad stress because I had some personal life problems that I couldn't figure out how to solve. And so I was, we were on a Black Flag tour and we were in Europe. We were in England at the time, 84. And I kept getting these hives or like my eye would swell shut. I could tell it was something to do with just nerves or, and so Kira, the bass player for Black Flag, she says, she goes, she says, I'll be right back. And she comes back with this little like stinky paperback book, like 50 pages. 
there was a used bookstore right on the corner from the hotel. And she got this book for like a dollar or a pound or whatever. And it was just called like yoga for beginners. And she said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to sit on the bed and read these to you what to do. And you get on the floor and you do these. And she read me through all the stretches of the whole book. It was a little book, Mm -hmm. but it had like 25 stretches in it. And as, so then as soon as I started doing those stretches every day, I never got the hives again. I never got them again in my life. Hmm. Just like that, just overnight. And I still do those stretches. Um, it's not, they're not, there's nothing. They're the normal, they're the normal stretches that everybody does. You know, the cobra, the plow, the lotus position, you know, touch your toes, reach the sky, twist to the side, hands over the head, uh, um, you know, calf stretches, all just normal, normal old stretches. Breathing too. You make sure you take deep breaths, just all that stuff. And then I got some drummer specific ones. The two drummer specific ones were as, as I, I open my hands. I know that sounds stupid, but if you sit there right now and just try to open your hands, open your hands like as hard as they can open, right? Yep. So putting all your fingers apart from each other. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now just try to open them a little further than that. Yeah. A little yeah. further to where you start feeling it stretching all those muscles on the inside of your hand especially that muscle that's kind of down below where your thumb hooks to your hand. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's my main, if somebody said you have to go on in five minutes and you can only do one stretch. Okay. That's the stretch I got to do. And then the other one is to stretch my forearm. And I do that in a way that it's hard to explain, but a lot, there's a lot of ways to stretch your forearm. You know, you kind of have to bend your hand backwards against your forearm. Yeah. And I, those are my two drumming specific stretches. The rest of them are just like out of that, out of that 50 cent stinky water <laughs> damaged yoga book that Kira bought. Yeah. With, with the, with those stretching out your forearm, do you grab just your four fingers or do you grab your thumb too? No, I have a really weird way of doing it. Okay. You know what? I'll send you a video <laughs> when we're done. If you remind me, no, cause, cause I don't, a lot of people, they do it like both at the same time or mm. they grab one with the other, yeah. but I have this really strange way. I do it that where it stretches it, you get the forearm stretch all the way up into the elbow. And I think that's why I've never had any tennis elbow, you know, any trouble with my elbows. I think yeah. it's because of this exact stretch, but I have a hard time teaching it to people because I made it up. Yeah. It wasn't in the book. Mm-hmm. Mm. Is this what, what you found that worked? Yeah. I'll, I'll send it. Cause you, I mean, you guys, you know, you guys, you, you guys, you know, you guys seem like pretty cool guys. I feel like we're kind of like best friends now. Right. Yeah. We're vibing. Right. <laughs> well, we're, I mean, you know, I, I, like what, is there a drummer over there or a guitar player? Bass? I play guitar. Aaron plays drums. Okay. So this, these two stretches, but I also just love hearing drum stuff because like... No, no, but listen to me. These two stretches will help the guitar and the drums and the bass equally as much. Cool. This is all about dexterity and speed and flexibility in your, in your hands, arms, and fingers. I mean, also, I've just gotten interested since like I'm 46 now. You're 59, right, Bill? Well, you sound like you're 20. Uh, Wait, yeah. someone there's uh-huh. 59? No, you're 59, aren't you? I'm 46. Oh, oh, I'm 59. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking we could bypass that thing. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I am. <laughs> um, but I mean, one of the things that I focus on a lot, like, you know, since I got past my 30s was just like wanting my body to not feel like garbage. And uh, so like any anytime I can figure out like ways to like achieve any sort of longevity and like alleviate any pain. I do this every single day and I'll tell you what it is right now. Uh I'll tell you, I think it's pretty easy to run through it. Okay. Touch the sky. And let's just say you hold each one of these for like a good couple of in breaths and out breaths, you know? So maybe, Mm -hmm. maybe eight, 10, eight, 10 seconds. Okay. Yeah. You reach the sky, right? Yeah. And then you, you know, your morning yawn where you kind of put your hands up. So where your hands are kind of by your ears. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you bend your back backwards. I call that a morning stretch. Do you know that stretch? Yeah. Yeah. So you do that stretch. So you go up, reach the sky, and then bring the arms down halfway down and do that backwards stretch where you're kind of like, oh, I got to wake up, stretch my back, that stretch, right? Uh-huh. 
So you do, you do all of these things, you do them three times. Okay, then you put your hands out to your sides, straight out, straight out to your sides, and then you twist 90 degrees. So your body's still facing forward, but mm -hmm. now, you're, now your head's turned 90 degrees. You twist your whole body 90 degrees, Yeah. right? Okay, then the other one is you, you put your hands down at your side, and then you take one hand and you bring it up, up over your head so that the one hand is reaching the sky. And then you lean down far so that you're stretching that whole side of your body. Yeah. Okay. And you hold all of these for like five, 10 seconds. And you do that on each side three times. Then you, then you put your hands out to your side and you put your, you put your, I mean, your, your arms straight out. And then you bend, you bend your hands back so they're stretching your forearm. And then you take your arms back as if you're trying to like stretch out your chest, like as if mm -hmm. you're trying to open up your chest. You take your arms back as far as you can get them, and you breathe, keep breathing. Then you bring them, then you bring your arms forward, and you clasp your hands together, right? Mm -hmm. You clasp your hands together, but at the same time, you try to pull your arms apart from each other, mm. but you can't pull them apart from each other because your hands are clasped together. But then that opens up your back, your back muscles. Yeah. Okay. Then you touch your toes. And so you touch your toes with your legs straight. Then you come up just a little bit and you bend your legs slightly and you just hang. So mm -hmm. you're hanging there and you'll feel that stretch more in your, in your back than you will in your, in your say calves or, uh, what do you call it? Hamstring. What's, what's the back of your thigh called? Hamstring. Okay. And you, so three times on that one, uh, and then, um, you know, the, you do the, you do the upward and the downward dog, uh, mm -hmm. or like you can just do the Cobra where you lay on your lay on your stomach and then you just lift your head up like a cobra and you coil back starting from the top of your head you coil back like a snake and you you, you raise yourself up and coil back that's called the cobra and um then i do the uh, cat and the cow yeah so that's like where you where you you arch you get on all fours and then you arch your back way up yeah and then you curve it way down and you arch your, that's called the cat and cow. That's a cat and cow. Yeah. And then, um, then the two drummer stretches, the open the hands thing. And then the, the, the forearm thing, forearm thing. I can't, it's not teachable, but I, if I send a video, maybe you get it, man. I'd love, I'd love to see the forearm stretch. So that's my thing. And I mean, if I'm in a hurry, I can get through that all in 15 minutes. Yeah. And so you've been doing this, you do this pre-show or first thing in the morning kira got the book when i was 19 20 and i've been doing it i do it it's funny i do it before the show but when i really do it is when you're warmed up and your blood's warm and your muscles uh -huh. are warm if you can force yourself to not not go backstage and socialize if you can force yourself to do it right after the show mm. or right after practice you'll notice you can stretch twice as far oh yeah everything's warm yeah you can stretch twice as far and then it's almost like then when you go to sleep that night, you you put your muscles to rest in a mm -hmm. good stretched out state, so you won't wake up the next morning and all be all cramped up. It's yeah. that's the best the best way to stretch is when you don't want to stretch, which is when you're finished with your cardiovascular exertion. That's when you stretch. Yeah. Mm. Then you can get twice as far. As far as sleep on tour, are you a good sleeper on tour, or do you have a hard time sleeping? The older I get, it's getting harder to sleep. Oh yeah. Uh, so I mean, that's that's like a complex subject because in the tour bus where it's moving and people are yelling and partying, that's it's almost impossible. You know, mm -hmm. maybe I might uh, lean on you know one of the many you know kind of sleep aid type things. Sure. You know, I drink like fifteen espresso before we play. Okay, so then <laughs> <laughs> literally. At 8.30, I drink a whole thermos full of espresso. All right? Wow. Yeah. 
not because I want to, or because I want to be a badass, but at, at age 60, that's how much caffeine how much I have need. to have yeah. in order to get those eighth notes out there. Because when people come, they want to hear that, ah, bah, 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 you know, yeah. that's, that's the thing they expect out of me. And they, you know, that was easy when I was 15, but at 60, it's more difficult. So, sure. So you get that 15 espresso going, you get your stretches going, you're just all sweaty and smelly. You play. And then what? Then what? You don't mm-hmm. go to sleep. Like nope. then you're just up till 7 a.m. because you drank 15 espresso. So yeah, <laughs> sleeping sleeping on tour is just a I just, just a nightmare, it sounds like. Yeah. yeah, it's it's not a nightmare, but it just is what it is. You know, you sleep when you can and you don't sleep when you can't. Gotcha. Now, didn't you drink a lot of espresso even when you were a teenager? Um, uh, before drumming? No, I mean one or two cups would, would do it. I see. But it's it's gone up from there. Oh, it goes up. You could almost at this point, it's almost like linear. You could just add add an espresso for every year. Who <laughs> drinks more coffee, you or Dave Grohl? Me, no, me, me, me. No, there's no, <laughs> only there's you. no, no one else. Only me. <laughs> I mean, for shows, for shows, only me. Only you. I'm not saying those guys don't drink a lot of coffee because they do, but I'm saying I cannot, I cannot play our material correctly and at the correct tempo unless I'm just wired out of my gills yeah (laughs) so i want to go back to the late 70s early 80s the early years of descendants um me too because i was like 16 (laughs) (laughs) what were you like as a 16 year old i just now back then my thing was snicker bars i'd eat like two snicker bars before practice why snickers why not twix (laughs) Oh, that's just the one I like. It's kind of got everything. It's got the crunch factor, yeah. the chocolate factor, and the like caramel factor, nougat, whatever you call it. It's a good time. I'm team Snickers. I don't really eat candy anymore, but yeah, that's my favorite candy. Well, these days I found a better thing, and you know who showed me it? What? Is the Kamuri guys. Fumio, the singer for Kamuri, he showed me. It's called a whatchamacallit. Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. That's a great candy bar. And with coffee, you know, because it's it's... It's it's a little crunchy and oh that's a great we stocked that in the vending machine at the studio because Kimori like likes it so much yeah I love that so what you call it is like almost like a a Twix or a Kit Kat combined with a Snicker it's really it's really the idealized candy bar yeah sounds like it I feel I feel like I've had a watch McCall but it's been so long oh I gotta get one now I just found out about them like eight years ago nice. So after this interview, Adam, go run out and get a whatchamacallit. I might. <laughs> that sounds good. Bill, I'm curious if back in the late 70s or 80s, you know, when you're when descendants are playing kind of part of this LA scene, this punk scene, if you are familiar at all with the ska scene in LA at that point. I I I was only in the most surface level, superficial way. You know, I knew I knew one song. I knew two songs from each of Madness, The Selector, and The Specials. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, like I was, I was that guy. That's all I knew. I didn't really, it's, it's funny. The people that have really showed me about ska and about really about all of Jamaican music, um, have been these, these ska bands that I've recorded, they've showed me because I said, Hey, I want to know more about this. I want to know where you guys come from. And so then they'll get into it with me. And then one time me and Milo were driving from Fort Collins to LA. Mm -hmm. And we were, we were in my car and we bought this CD set called the history of Jamaican music. And we listened to all the CDs on the way out to LA and Milo, we would play the song and then Milo would read the booklet. I was driving and we'd play the song and then Milo would read the booklet. It was just he and I, you know, in my car. And, um, so it's like, I don't know, you got your, like that first kind of ska, which is different than the other kind of ska. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the reggae, the dance hall, uh, all of those things. And it, it explained all of it. And I remember the very first song on this set was like a, it was just like an old beat up acoustic guitar and this guy and he's going, 
chink, inside chink, chink. Oh, Carolina, chink, chink. Oh, Carolina, chink, chink, chink. Whatever that song is, like, oh, Carolina. And that mm-hmm. was the first song on this CD set. And the funny thing is that the very last song on the CD set was also Oh Carolina, but done by uh, like a modern day band. Hmm. So they took it full circle. Interesting. So this was, was really cool to read about all that and, you know, try to learn about it or at least, you know, it's at least be aware of it, not just be such a mm-hmm. dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> so the, so you weren't aware of the, L, the LA scene specifically. Cause I'm, there's a band in the eighties called uh, the untouchables who were a pretty big band in LA. Oh yeah. I know. I knew the untouchables. Yeah. I knew a couple of those songs. Yeah. Okay. There was a band, a uh, short-lived band in like the late 70s, early 80s in LA called the Box Boys. I don't know that one. I don't know that one. And so there, one of their singers was Betsy Weiss, who went on to front the metal band Bitch. Oh, funny. That's weird how you can just shift gears like that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I wonder when people can do that. Am I like, am I jealous that they can do that. And I just kind of only know how to just do my thing. I do whatever, like for better or for worse. (laughs) Am I jealous of them? Or is it like, does that mean that they, they, they kind of like don't have a soul. They're like a chameleon. You know, I don't know what it is. How does that work? What do you, what do you think about that? I do think there's value in perfecting a very specific thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Less than Jake wrote a song about you. They didn't write a song about Betsy bitch. (laughs) (laughs) True. They might though. Yeah. But I wasn't trying to make a thing about Betsy bitch. I was more, it's weird when people just put on a new, you know, a new musical costume, if you will. Mm -hmm. Cause I always feel like with me, I feel like no matter where I go, I'm, you're always, aren't you kind of always carrying around on your back? all the, of you know, where you came from and what you did in the past. Don't you, sure. don't you own that, you know, forever? I've always found it weird. All the, all the guys that have been in hardcore bands that go on to be in these, like, like elect electronic type bands. Yeah. Cause it makes you feel, yeah, that punk or hardcore, it was just a phase they went through. Right. And then, and then, so, but then how do you, does that mean you're you got left behind and you didn't move on in time or were they like was their heart never in it in the first place you know which is it Mm -hmm. or are they just faking it now or or both or were they maybe maybe they're always faking it i'm trying to think of a a classic chameleon that way that can just that can be all things to all people and i know i've never i've never liked that trait in in a person or or in a band what do you think of David Bowie? He's kind of the classic chameleon. Yeah, but Bowie was always doing Bowie. But I think his his thing was being a chameleon. Like that was his thing. And so he it, it, it's a, that's a little bit different for me. Yeah, that's a little bit different. Yeah, it it's it's baked into the identity. It's like the identity is the ever-changing thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or maybe, you know, maybe we're just rationalizing because we love Bowie and you can't, you know, you just can't mess with him because he's great. I mean, I, yeah. it's weird. I have my like weird little, you have your little rules and platitude for punk rock, but then, and then people will go, well, Joey, Joey Ramon did that. And that's like, well, yeah, but Joey's different. Joey gets to do whatever the fuck he wants. Yeah. And Bowie's kind of in that category too. You know, it doesn't mean the rule doesn't exist just because somebody Broke the rule. That doesn't mean the rule doesn't exist. Sure, yeah. Do you have any good Joey stories? Yeah, I have one. No, I have two. Okay. Which one's better? Okay, I think this is the better one. Okay. We were at Warp Tour, like, uh, let's say, Asbury Park. And, and me and, me and uh, Bug, our roadie, Bug, he was our roadie for like 30 years, okay? Mm -hmm. and um we were just walking around the grounds kind of checking out the festival and we were you know we were going to play a little later and we we ran into joey and i mean i i'm not real close with those guys right but bug really wanted to meet joey and talk to joey that remote bug worships the remotes so i'm like okay right 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 so you know we we went up to him and bug started talking and you know the sentence and whatever and 
and Joe, you know, Joey's kind of an awkward dude, you know, right? So, so, but he, he, he looks at me and he goes, can you play that song about the van? That's my favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> and I, th- I thought, I thought both bug and I were going to faint. Cause I, I, you know, I mean, I, Joey Ramone is like, he's like a real, a real day Fonzie. I mean, he's the coolest guy on two legs ever, period. The Ramones were the coolest band to ever exist. And so when he actually knew who we were at all and was able to name a favorite song and that it, that it wasn't one of our like normal songs, that it was one of our songs that nobody really likes, you know, but he liked it. I just thought that that was a great little moment for me. Ah, oh, that's fucking amazing. I love it. And just to hear him say that in his voice, you know, what do you yeah. do? For, just, just <laughs> to hear him say that, it was like, yeah, it was great. Um, I think it would be fun to talk about drumming a little bit more. Adam, did you have, did Justin ever send you questions? Uh, my friend Justin wanted to know your current tour gear rundown. What are you, what are you touring with? Oh, it's funny because we don't, I mean, we never have our own gear. Oh, you're just using backline that they provide. We always fly, but my, my, I mean, my thing has been the same since the dawn of time. Mm-hmm. I resumed my endorsement with DW um, maybe five, six years ago. I, cause I used to be, I used to be, uh, and there, is it an endorser or an endorsee? Let's see. Do they endorse me or do I endorse them? They, they endorse you, but then in, in turn, you are endorsing them. You're both endorsing each other. No, I'm saying like, Hey, use their drums. And then they're, they're providing me with whatever they're providing me with. Okay. Yeah, but that, I think they're, they're both the, called the same thing, but they're both two different actions. Right. Okay. Well, anyway, yeah. so I'm back. I'm <laughs> back with DW. Um, and uh, so I use, I mean, my thing's been the same since the dawn of time. I use a 24 ish kick. Sometimes it has to be a 22 kick if, if, if the tom, if the rack tom they give me is too deep, then it has mm-hmm. to be a twenty-two kick, or I can't get the tom low enough because it, you know, it'll hit the kick drum. Does that make sense? Yeah, because my rack tom's really like on top of the kick, okay. more so than anybody. It's not kind of off to the edge. It's really like on top of the kick. So if it's too deep of a rack tom, then I, it, it's too high. So then it has to be a twenty-two kick. But I prefer a twenty-four kick. Mm-hmm. Okay, the rack tom, I I prefer a fourteen, but I mean, I'll I play whatever they give me. I don't, I'm not, I'm not like a fussy gear guy. There's certain things that if they're not right, I can't really play correctly. But other than that, yeah. I'm cool. Thirteen tom, fourteen, fifteen, whatever, it's fine. Just don't don't make a big deal out of it. Uh, floor tom, I like an eighteen a lot. Um, if it's a sixteen, uh, depending on how it sounds, sometimes you can get a sixteen to have. You know, just a nice tone as well. Mm-hmm. With the snares, I, I've been it seems like I've been using the metal. You know, like the DW makes a, a what do you call it? Nickel, nickel over nickel over brass, or I don't know what the terms are for it. But the like the DW metal snare that's kind of um, you know, say similar to what a you know the Black Beauty kind of is the is the uh, gold uh, standard kind of the well not the gold standard but just that's the commonly known term for that kind of snare but the dw one uh i wish i could think of the name of it but that's so it's just like a 14 by six and a half it's not it's the most common snare in the world that's that's it i use i use four crash symbols it's usually it's like they're like one two three four if anybody if the person knows my setup they'll know what i mean they're all four and they're all at the exact same height and they're all straight and i usually use 19s on the edges and then on the middle i use 20s uh, and then the ride i like a big nice thick ride with a good ping and a good bell uh, and that, those are all i use zildjian symbols i've been using zildjian sim- symbols since i was well forever forever but mm-hmm. well not forever ever but a lot of my life i guess and then um so that those are yeah 19 and 20 inch crashes like 22 inch 22 or is that a 24 no a 22 inch ride because i can't fit the 24 or i don't it's too spread out when i use the 24 but i like a 24 inch ride okay 
and the hi hat. I like pretty crisp hi hats. Um, you know, there's several different ones, but um, I like them to be pretty crisp. And uh, with the ride symbol, like I don't like it to be too washy. Mm -hmm. um, I tend toward, I tend toward um, a, a little bit of a thicker head on the snare, but it could be, it could be any one of like something with maybe a little, a little deadening ring on the outside. I mean, that's built into it or, and, and or maybe a little reinforcement dot in the middle mm -hmm. it could be different things. Uh, I'm not too fussy. Tom's it tends to be, tends to be like a two ply normal normal two ply head kick drum i like it to be pretty thick like my kick drum's usually pretty dead i mean where it doesn't you know it doesn't go like boom so much it kind of goes like doof, you know doof. <laughs> yeah um and the same with the toms i like the toms to kind of sound like like the floor tom is like a a little bit of a younger cousin of the kick drum so it's like doof Doof. And the rack tom is like doof, 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 but not so much like boing, 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 not so much boing, boing, boing. Yeah. I, oh, the, probably the one thing, oh, here's probably the one thing I do that's unique. I have to use one of those thrones where it's all like completely hollowed out in the middle. There's nothing because mm. I have really bad prostatitis. I mean, I have okay. the worst prostatitis. And so if I sit on a normal drum throne for a half hour, I can't feel my lower half of my body. It just all goes numb. I take the throne and then I cut out all the parts. You know how bike seats are where the middle parts cut out? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, but picture that, but it's like a three-inch a three inch by 14-inch rectangle that's just hollowed out with nothing there. So my wow. prostate doesn't touch anything. <laughs> TMI? Damn. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's that's too part soon, of getting old. Too soon. I mean, we're right. we're good for this, right? We we yeah yeah. What, what type of what type of kick pedal? Uh different ones. Does it matter? It 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 matters, but it more matters how I set it. I yeah. could whatever the five leading kick drum pedals are. If you give me five minutes with them, I can just set it, and I'll be I'll be just fine. How do you like to set it up? I think I like. I like a little bit more of like a thwap, you know, so the beater is the resting position of the beater is kind of further away from the head than a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So when I kid it, it goes like thwack, you know, or like gloof. And, and the spring maybe isn't as tight because I'm not trying to, 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 to play like that. What do you call that? That in the, but like, yeah, like, like a, uh, do that, do that, do that, do that, do that. I'm not trying to play that. And so I like more more of a thwunk or like a gloof. And I keep my kick drum head kind of loose. So when it when the beater hits the kick drum, it kind of burrows into it like thwunk, you know? Like mm -hmm. thwunk. That's what it is. And I could get that with any with any um any beater, any drum really. My the drummer in my old band, Joey, used to he would tape nickels or not nickels, quarters. One to the bass drum head and one to the beater of his pedal. Yeah, but who wants their bass drum to sound like a tambourine or triangle? <laughs> yeah, apparently he did. <laughs> yeah, Robo Robo used to do that. He used a, oh yeah, but it was weird because Robo couldn't make up his mind. He had a twenty six inch kick drum with the heads mm -hmm. really tight, and he had the front head on really tight too, with no hole in it. So it's going boom boom. But then he would yeah. use like, yeah, some metal, metal impact with a wooden beater or high impact stuff to get that tick. But you can't hear the tick anywhere because it's just boom, boom. So then he, he, he actually mounted a mic to the inside of the drum so you could actually get a mic because you can't get a mic inside the drum because there's no hole. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, I, but I, no, I, I don't do that. I, I like it. I don't like it. That real brittle pointed thing where it sounds like, Sounds like you're, you know, rubbing your two fingernails together. I don't really like that sound so much. Mm -hmm. I did have one question. I was, I've read a little bit of interviews about, I think you talking about ways to you know, continue playing drums, you know, as you get older without, you know, wearing yourself out. You talked about stretching and stuff, but don't you also sort of apply techniques so that you're not overplaying? 
so that you're able to get more out of the drums without having to put as much into it? Yeah, I'll never forget this. It was like 84, 85. Black Flag was practicing. We practiced in this like row. It was like a a square of of like kind of little industrial building storage spaces, just little lame little buildings. But it all it all squared around a a city park. And sometimes we would just practice with the door open, so if anyone was in the park, they could come peek their head in and hear us practice. But we our our room was carpeted and sound deadened, so there wasn't a lot of sound coming out. You know, you could talk over it. I mean, it wasn't blowing out the park people at all. It was just we just liked the idea because the the park had a really diversified demography. There was old, young, fat, skinny, black, white, brown. You know, and it was like, well, this is really cool. And when we would take a break, we would always we could buy a watermelon from this dude on the street for a buck, and we would cut the watermelon up in the park and eat the watermelon. So we kind of became friends with these these locals that were in the park. Mm-hmm. So we were on a break, and this like seriously like a seventy year old wino dude came in and and he's going oh well. You know, y'all, you ain't hitting that snare drum the right way. Let me show you how to hit that snare drum. <laughs> and I go, oh, okay, yeah, you're going to show me. Because I would use like kind of my whole arm and kind of like try to beat the snare drum to death. And he goes, I can get more sound out of that snare drum with the flick of my wrist than you can flounder, flailing around, fucking around like you are. And I go, okay, well, let me hear it. And I, I listened to him play and I watched what he was doing. And I go, God, he's right. His snare sounds better and just more right. And he's not, he, all he's doing is he's just using a little bit of arm power, a little bit of wrist power, and a lot of finger power. And so that really, that one moment was like, oh, wow, okay. Yeah. And plus, yeah. And so I, I kind of, I, I kind of have always tried to really regulate my, so that my volumes are really consistent to where, like, if you just put one mic in the room, you could hear all the drums equally. And then that was my, I always put a lot of effort into that for years and years. But then, then like however many years, eight years ago, when I got, when I finally got in-ear monitors and then, okay, you know, me being an engineer and all, you know, I could, and I could control my in-ear monitors. So my, my in-ear monitors, when we play, it sounds exactly like our records. Like it sounds so Damn. good. And so when I'm playing, I can really hear any little errors in the tone. Like if I'm not hitting the drum in that, I'm going to call it the sweet spot. There's just a way to hit a drum the way I like it. It's got a, it's a little tiny bit off center and you, you get a rim shot, but you don't get too much rim. The drum has to not be tuned too tight or too, too loose and you just get that nice tone and in the in-ear monitors you're just sitting there and every hit you totally just you're your own worst judge and you're just going oh no quit hitting it like that you're choking it out on the rim or no you're hitting it too softly no you're hitting it too hard you're choking the tone out of the drum and so now it's just on this game of like trying to get those perfect hits every time and so that's made me yeah kind of think about economy of motion and just also with the inner monitors i can really tell if i mess if i'm messing with the tempos too much plus one of the ways i practice is i have all the songs like tempo mapped where there's a click that plays with the original songs and i don't mean that the songs play with the click i mean the click plays with the songs i went through and tempo mapped all of our songs so that the click plays with the original versions without you know, so they really go how they really go. And I practice to that. And it's, I've, so I've been really sensitive to just any little movements and all that stuff. So I think when I listen, I think probably I'm not as good to look at now, but I'm way better to listen to live. Like I'm, I really have my, really have my game on. Like if I listen to our live recordings, it's, I'm, re, I'm really doing it the right way now. Yeah. Nice. Hell yeah. So I think we're going to we're going to go behind the curtain now. I want to ask you about backpacking. Ooh, the soft white underbelly. Yes. 
Don't go anywhere. If you want to hear the rest of this conversation, head over to our Patreon. Thank you for listening to In Defense of Scott. Please rate and review this podcast and tell a friend. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at In Defense of Scott. Pick up Aaron's book, In Defense of Ska, at your local bookstore or online. This podcast is edited by Chris Reeves of Ska Punk International. This is your co-host, Adam Davis of Omnigong, leaving you by saying Ska now more than ever. You good? I'm good. I'm waiting for you. Okay, I'm good too. Hey. <laughs> Thanks for checking out this episode. And if not take if you take nothing else away from this episode, just know that you could be in a band like the Decepticons and then later in your life be in a band like the Loving Poppers. I wow. think that's a lesson to learn from this. That is a great lesson. I'm glad that we can provide lessons on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, manzies. Hey. You know what else though? What else? We have a Patreon. Yeah. And that helps to support this podcast, the editing, the hosting, all the bells and whistles. And if you just pay $5, this conversation doesn't have to end. No. It continues behind the curtain. This, this time we talked to Jorge and you know, he was a little, he's a little embarrassed about his Decepticons history. So behind the curtain, we dug in a little deeper to try to embarrass him a little more. <laughs> <laughs> and we quoted some of his lyrics at him. Uh, although he didn't write the lyrics, to be fair, but still. Still embarrassing. Still embarrassing. Aaron, so, next yes. week, yes. who do we have? Ooh, big guest. Oh, yeah. Punk rock icon. Oh, no. Yeah. His name is? Do you have any guesses? Uh, no. Go ahead. Okay. Because I know who it is, but if I guess. <laughs> it's Bill Stevenson. Oh, wow. Yeah drummer for the descendants and black flag owner of the blasting room recording studio also the band all oh yeah you ever see that video where that guy's running and he's on fire yeah it's great probably my favorite music video yeah yeah that was uh uh spike jones right i think so all right spike jones when are you going to do the podcast spike jones come come on in defense of ska bye bye